Welcome to February. That's it. The January window is shut. We actually recruited five players, including two Academy players. And we said goodbye to Leander Den Donker, a wizard. And what's interesting to me is that four of our new recruits have four really interesting attributes in common. I love me a good recruitment profile. I love it when Monchi gets his men. Let's review Aston Villa's January transfer window. That was a very different January window from some of the ones we've experienced in the past. And I am fascinated with transfers in general and the whole recruitment process. Like, how does a transfer start? Does it start with a call to the agent? How much time is spent between eyeballs and analytics? And perhaps most importantly of all, what is the recruitment criteria as established by the top guy, which in this case is Unai Emery? I've used this analogy before, but... You know, the transfer process and shopping for players is not dissimilar to shopping for real estate. And if you've ever gone on one of those realtor.com sites, well, they give you this list of filters on the side that you check your must-haves. So you click that soaker tub box and the enclosed garage box and the must-have three to four bedrooms box and you hit search and out comes this list, starting with the cheapest and most derelict properties that you'd never want to live in at the top, going down to the luxury homes that you probably can't even afford. Well, this is not dissimilar to how Unai Emery, using his vision of the squad and seeing where he has some assets, where he has liabilities, his criteria is what Monchi will build his list from. So Monchi gives us the list, and then the most important thing is that the most desirable from a profile and also price point standpoint are vetted thoroughly, not just for on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. Work habits and personality are almost as important as talent. And here's where the themes start to emerge with regards to our January captures. The first one is age. Between the four of them, the average age is just 20 which is well below the de-risking age of about 23. That's the industry standard in terms of rolling the dice on young players. The other is height. If you put them all together, our recruits average six foot one in stature. That's physically imposing. And if you've watched this show before, you'll know what I have to say, that we needed to beef up a little bit, I think, in our squad. And Newcastle was a perfect example of how physical stature can be a benefit at times. But maybe the most important characteristic of all, the biggest criteria is attitude, humility, work rate, the desire to learn, grow, and to become a top, top professional. And all of our recruits have that in their profile. And it didn't take me a whole lot of research or time to find that out and read about it. I mean, everyone on that list has talent. If you don't have raw ability, you're not getting on any kind of scouting list. But the guy that wants to stay late and work harder and doesn't want to go out with his mates to the nightclub on a Saturday night or stay up till 4 a.m. playing the Xbox while eating haagen those guys mitigate the age risk that you're taking on. And we've signed four of them. And the last two recruitment themes from this January window are cost and high potential. If you added up all our recruits from this window, our initial outlay up front is around 17 to 18 million pounds, which really is only just a little bit more than we paid for Morgan Sanson. Obviously, FFP played a factor in this particular window. But if you were to wait with all of them another two to three years when they got to that next club and sort of established themselves a little bit more solidly in their careers, you could be paying as much as 10, 15, 20 to 25 million for each of them. So this is where the high potential comes in. Is it a gamble? Yes, it is. Does it address our immediate needs today? Mm, probably not, but it's not inconceivable to think that all four of these players could be 
fighting for places in the squad next year. Another thing Monchi will know based on his vast network of football people and scouts and even agents is which clubs are not in the best economic position to negotiate. There is talent in every corner of the planet. We know that. And some of these clubs would love to keep their prized assets for as long as possible and grow them into bigger transfer fees. But the reality is they're not in an economic position to do so. They need to keep the lights on. So let's review the physically big, relatively inexpensive, and super high potential recruitment class of January 2024. Keelan Quinn is not a senior signing, but anytime you drop a million quid on a 16-year-old, it's probably worth mentioning another talent we've pinched from the West Bromwich Albion Academy, which isn't really a surprise given the Mark Harrison links, and probably it's not a bad thing for the Baggies to keep selling up to Aston Villa. Not a lot of information on the kid. He's a midfielder, and he'll be playing with the U16s right away. Joseph Gauchi. Aston Villa have found their first Australian goalkeeper since fan favorite and local nightclub favorite Mark Bosnich. Gauchi will turn 24 in July and stands at an imposing six foot, almost four inches tall. And just recently, he's broken into the Socceroos national team. There were two games that he started because he's pushing Matt Ryan now. And he was the man of the match in both of them. One was a loss against Ecuador and the other was a win against Bahrain. He's at the Asian Cup right now. Unlike Bosnich, he likes staying at home and getting his diet right and his sleep right. And that's a good sign for us because he is extremely dedicated about the next level. And I found this encouraging as well. In the A-League, he's faced 11 penalty kicks. He saved four of them. Not bad. The scouting report is relentless worker and a very good shot stopper, aided in part by his very long and lean frame. And the focus right now, for him at Adelaide United at least, was distribution and game management. And his coach said that Gauchi was a really fast learner. And here's a player where Villa thought we better pounce now because he's starting to get some profile with his country. Let's get him while the price is right. And for a very difficult position to fill, who wants to back up the best goalkeeper in the world? Who's the nailed on starter? Well, you know what? A hardworking young guy, may be the perfect solution. It'll certainly keep Emmy Martinez honest, but he will probably want to learn from the Yashin winner. Obviously, the big question is, in the short term, would he be able to, say, next season, play in Carabao Cup or FA Cup games, or even in games in a European week, if we're lucky enough to have those again? And then, of course, you also wonder, does he have the technical ability to play the sweeper-keeper role, which Unai Emery demands of his goalkeeper? And it's funny, because at his club, Adelaide United, the focus over the last six months has been positioning, technical work, and all that stuff. And because he's really committed to doing the extra work, you think he's going to be a quick study. My gut tells me he's been brought in to upgrade on Philip Marshall and Sinisalo. Is he ready to push Robin Olsen out now? Or is he going to go on a loan? That remains to be seen. He's at the Asian Cup right now pushing Matt Ryan hard. In fact, there's people within the Aussie footballing community that say, Gauchi should be starting now over Ryan, the older, more veteran guy from AZ Alkmaar. And if you're the starter of Australia, you're not a slouch. Left fullback Lino Sousa only just turned 19 and yet another recruit from the West Bromwich Albion Academy who can represent England, which he has at the youth international level, or his birth country, Portugal. Signed and immediately sent on loan to Plymouth Argyle. It'll be fun to watch him there. We seem to have a good relationship with Plymouth Argyle. And the book on him is that he has as much potential going forward and causing nightmares in the front third as he is solid defensively. But since joining Arsenal in 2022, and despite a whole lot of buzz around the player, he really didn't get an opportunity. 
an Arsenal player not getting an opportunity and then joining Aston Villa. I wonder if that's ever happened before. It's not really common to have U16 players playing two years up in the U18 academy levels, but Sousa did and with great effect at West Bromwich Albion before moving to Arsenal. And everybody says the same thing about this guy. He's got a beautiful left foot. He is extremely athletic, and whether you're a scout or a coach or anybody who's come in contact with him, they all say he is destined for big things, and they've been saying that since he was 15 years of age. And another six-footer who will be familiar to some of the Villa staff, Mark Harrison and company, and of course some of the players too, Rico Richards and now Morgan Rogers. So that might help him assimilate if he does start next year with the senior club. Now, Arsenal is no poor selling club by any means, but their hand may have been forced a little bit on this one because Sousa's deal was expiring this summer, and who knows if Arsenal's a little bit up against it FFP-wise right now. Their focus, obviously, is on challenging for a title. So here's where maybe Monchi understanding the economic situation took some advantage. And by the way, we signed him as an academy player, which puts him in a different folder, in a different spreadsheet, keeps him away from the FFP business while he now goes and plays men's football for the Pilgrims. Kosta Nedeljkovic, who just turned 18 in December and six foot tall, and believe it or not, even at just 18, he could be playing and even starting with Serbia this summer in Germany. He is a regular starter now for Red Star Belgrade, and he was a starter in the Champions League against young boys, and most notably... Jack Grealish and Manchester City where he got 78 minutes and he kind of neutralized Jack Grealish in that game. The goals didn't come from his side of the park, but what I find incredible about him is his pace. He clocked 36.4 kilometers per hour in a match this season, which puts him in the Kylian Mbappe class of pace. The book on this cat, apart from his pace, excellent dribbler, excellent deliverer of the ball, either in open play or from the dead ball, but most importantly described as the quintessential modern fullback, which is a specialist position now, because what kid wants to be a fullback? They either want to be a goalkeeper, a number 10, or a striker. Who wants to be a fullback? And this guy is committed, so he understands the part going forward as well as the defensive part, and he is smart and loves a duel, and a physical challenge. So when he sees who the left winger is, he says, my mission in these 90 minutes is to nullify that player and win the physical and mental battle against him. And that part excites me. There's been this perception that Unai Emery prefers his right back to be a little bit more stay-at-home, a little bit more conservative, but I don't know if that's actually true. I think it's more a function that it's really hard to get two modern, dynamic, athletic, talented both ways fullbacks into the same team. If he had that luxury, I'm sure he would gladly have players like that in his team. What really impressed me the most, though, about Nedeljkovic is that the 21st Group, which is an analytics firm that ranks athletes around the world, well, they had him as the number four right back in all of Europe for players born 2005 or later. The 21st Group is a reputable firm. Think about that for a minute. Think about all the teams in Europe in all the leagues. That's a lot of right backs. And ours is ranked fourth out of all of them from 2005 and later. So hopefully he finishes the season with a stormer at Red Star, then gets selected and plays for Serbia during the European Championships in Germany. And then there's no reason to think that he couldn't come into our squad and compete for at least a place in the squad and maybe even a starting opportunity. And by the way, if he goes and does play for Serbia this summer and he does well, well, his price will inflate. And we've stepped in and jumped the queue and said, no, even at 18, we're getting you now. 6.4 million pounds is the total package. But that might be a snip. Imagine if he does do really well this summer and he gets the opportunity. 
Monchi's people said, go get him now. Morgan Rogers, six foot three, turns 22 this coming July and can play nine, 10, or 11. His versatility is one of his key attributes, and that's probably why it didn't really work out for him at Manchester City. A guy that can play multiple positions, probably has good footballing IQ. Pep wants you in this little tiny box of one thing. He did thrive at Lincoln City, even as an 18-year-old. And he also thrived during cutthroat relegation battle type games with Blackpool. This guy had his youth at West Bromwich Albion. This is a theme, of course. But even at five, they were calling him a prodigy, which is a little bit gross. I hate that. But the coaches from that time were saying when he kicked a ball, it made a sound that we had never heard from five-year-olds before. And he always played like two to three years up in his age group. And with all those West Bromwich Albion connections, again, comes really good character references for this player. It's virtually impossible to say today if Rodgers is our prized asset from this window, even though we've paid the most for him because Costa Nadal Delkovich is rated so highly in his position, only time will tell. But there's so much to like about this player, not just on the field, but between the ears as well. And how long have we been saying that Villa struggles at times against a low block? Well, Roger's thing is to play in tight spaces, great technical ability, first touch is beautiful, loves to receive a pass, even in a crowd, great on the half turn, and he wants to set up chances. I think he probably enjoys creating opportunities as much as he does finishing them. I rewatched the Middlesbrough FA Cup game just to see what all the fuss was about, and kind of there wasn't any because Middlesbrough only had 38% of the ball in that game. He did test Emmy Martinez in the first half with a good strike, but it was the same situation again at Chelsea a few days later, a game in which he scored actually quite a nice goal. But if you're without the ball, there's things to see there as well. And frankly, in the Villa game, he was playing on the right side of the front three and yeah, he was out of possession a lot, but your job there is to get into the right position and then be patient and not turn the ball over when it comes your way. And to me, he looked very mature doing that. The biggest thing, though, that he has to improve and change quickly is that there's a tendency to want to play that killer pass every single time. And personally, as a young player, I would rather have a guy that's like that and has the guts to do that rather than the one that is always turning the ball negative but in the championship he turned the ball over a lot like I think top 10 in the championship and this is why Unai Emery might be perfect for him because you know Unai's shtick manage moments manage the game but as I alluded to earlier maybe the most important attribute to Morgan Rogers is something you can't quantify through scouting or through stats and that's his attitude and his behavior this is a young guy who acts like a top, top professional and is dedicated to growing and becoming better. Not a surprise that he comes from a solid family, but that makes him an absolute dream to work with if you're a coach or if you're a teammate. And every time I see him talk now or I read about the guy, I get really, really strong Ollie Watkins vibes, don't you? mature, confident, professional, hardworking, dedicated, all those good words. And those guys generally tend to advance. And that's not even the most exciting aspect of Morgan Rogers, to me anyway. I found it very cool and interesting that the Rogers family is very tight with the Bellinghams. And Morgan Rogers is besties with Cole Palmer from their Man City day. So you've got Jude and Cole, two players who have gone on this meteoric rise as young guys and established themselves in top environments. That is extremely rare. The majority of players are slow burners, and that's what Morgan Rogers is. But Jude Bellingham is a nailed-on starter for England this summer. Is Cole Palmer going to make that squad? He might just. And maybe this will be his coming out party this summer. Who knows? But are you telling me that Morgan Rogers wouldn't do anything to join those two guys as part of the senior England setup? In fact, he wants to be the guy that plays between them and sets up Cole Palmer for goals. You know, sometimes... Take a high potential player and then surround him with other really high caliber players, like an improvement for where he came from, in a more challenging environment and with a very detail-oriented and clear visionary manager. And you know what? 
the opportunity is there for him to excel. I mean, the Premier League will be an adrenaline rush all by itself. And then to be back in a familiar area with some familiar faces around in terms of teammates and former staff, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that Morgan Rogers is going to contribute in a meaningful way before this season is over. And very quickly on the outbound track, you have Josh Feeney and Tommy O'Reilly about to start their Spanish adventure at Real Union. I can't wait to see how they make out and also, you know, how much value there is in this club cooperation network. Leander Den Donker, a handy player for us, but on high wages and he just wasn't playing I hope he gets that chance at Napoli. That's a great move for him. But we also had to say goodbye to a wizard. Oh, Bertrand Traore, so often injured. But he also probably scored three of my favorite goals in the past probably 10 years. Turning Sam Johnson into a stone statue at the Hawthorns a couple of years ago was iconic for me. And the top bins goal against Manchester United at home was utter sorcery. But it was the two goals he scored last spring, without which we might not have qualified for Europe, that were just vital at a weird time where he hadn't played for eons. But at Leicester, he steps into a first-time strike that wins the game late. And then a week later, I get to watch with my own two eyes as he scores the game winner against Forrest. Again, where would we have been without those six points? What an unusual player, but one that will always be remembered at Aston Villa. Unfortunately, also a high earner and a great Africa Cup of Nations with goals for Burkina Faso. I really and sincerely hope he stays fit, healthy, happy, and he contributes to Villarreal the way he did with us and with less injuries. To summarize, Morgan Rogers is an upgrade on Bertrand Traore in our squad, if just for the fact that he's gonna be available and not hopefully injured, but that could be dramatic in the years to come. Lino Sousa, I'm thinking, is being lined up to be at least the heir apparent left back as early as next year. It'll be fun watching him at Plymouth Argyle. Joe Gauci, obviously being brought in to push Robin Olsen right now, then let's see. Our current right back cover is Kane Kessler-Hayden, but you know, Nedeljkovic is such high potential. You wonder if he's ready to compete for that position as early as next year. And then the only question I have left is, can Tim Irogbunum step in and fill the void left by Leander Den Donker? We've seen tiny little glimpses, but it's time to turn those glimpses into full-fledged performances. My gut tells me we're gonna cash in on Luca Dean this summer. I mean, he's one of our highest earners. He's in his prime. We've heard all these links with Middle Eastern clubs. Why else would we bring in Lino Sousa, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if we also then had another high profile outgoing for decent cash to give us a little bit of summer flexibility. And if we did that and we qualified for the Champions League, that would put us in a very good position, both short and medium term. If these fresh young faces can contribute sooner rather than later, and you have to think our hierarchy has planned for that to happen, well then the squad is gonna be infused with some energy and so will the fans. There is something inherently exciting about new young players. And straight out of the cliche cupboard, if you're good enough, you're old enough. Until Sheffield United, be well, and as always, up the mighty villa.